Hello, it's Anthony. Hey, Anthony, how you doing? This is Bay from Total Legion Radio. Hey, man, what's happening? Nothing. You are happening, man. Come on. You you know that. Man, listen, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you sharing your time with me, man. Thank you for doing this. I know you're busy. Thank you very much. Uh, back at you, man. Back at you. You know, it, it it's like like – uh, it's it's killing me. It's driving me crazy. I'm trying to remember. I'm here in the Philadelphia area, and you guys, yeah. I saw play the Tower Theater. You know, back yeah. in the day. And I'm trying to remember who you guys opened for. I'm thinking to myself, was it L.A. Guns? Yeah, it was Dangerous Toys and L.A. Guns. That's we were it. all out on the road together. I think it was wow. crazy. We uh, that was one of the my favorite tours that we ever did. Um, but we just I mean, LA Guns had been out and been around for a while, and the the first night that we started with them was in Dayton, Ohio, I think is where we kicked off. And we walked in the hotel, and and somebody walked by, a road manager, or one of the crew guys, and said, "Hey, everybody, come down the come down to the uh, uh, the bar at uh, at seven o'clock or whatever it was, you know, and uh, to the foyer of the hotel or whatever." And so we went down there, and we were like, "Wow, man, this is gonna be." pretty crazy we were brand new man we had never toured or hardly been out on the road but we walked down and we didn't know what they were going to say but man they had we're waiting at the bar and they said we're fisting a kickoff eight weeks together and we're going to have the best time of our life and they had drinks and stuff with us and it was just like immediately we just knew we were going to have the freaking time of our life man. (laughs) and the the dangerous toys guys were from texas so we you know we kind of clicked with them right away because we kind of had a southern thing going on and, uh, man, we ended up having so much fun. We were getting on each other's buses. And, I mean, I think eventually on the end of that, they wouldn't even let us uh, hang out with each other. They were like, listen, we're sp- it was like herding cats, you know, th- for bus call and all that stuff at the end of the night. We were little and running around crazy. And finally they just said, look, everybody just get on your own bus and let's do a head count. And you guys, we got to separate everybody. But we we just loved them. And I, I still talk to Jason. I, I talked to him a few months back. He's just, he's an incredible singer. I mean, that guy, he hadn't changed a bit. His voice is freaking strong as shit. He's, he's just great, you know, and I'm happy. I think I see them uh, in just a couple of weeks. We're going to do, oh, cool. have, a, have a gig at the same time. So, but yeah, that's one of my, my favorite memories was being out with them. We just, we played some of the most beautiful theaters too. I mean, it was like, we couldn't believe it. We were walking in these places. They were Amazing, you know the Fox I, Theater, and I, I remember though, like the, the one thing I really remember about that show, beside it being awesome, was was just the fact that um, I remember being like up in the lobby of the tower beforehand, and there was just such a buzz about the whole show and all three of the bands with the fans. Like it was such a, you know, God, like, just a, it was crazy, yeah. yeah. And it, it was a good it was, buzz. Uh, Ballad of Jane, yeah, Ballad yeah. of Jane was out for them that cocked and loaded record god it was kick-ass man. i mean we watched them every night they were freaking awesome and then of course uh jason and them were doing teasing pleasing and sporting a woody and i mean it was hilarious we were having the best times with them i mean we just laughed and that it was so fun to just do it together you know uh, the yeah. dangerous toys guys had really taken off they they were you know a little ahead of us and definitely man crowd wise and stuff they just kicked the crowd's ass every night i mean they went out there and just blew their freaking face off it was it was awesome they oh i know what it was scared that was the single that was out when we yeah yeah and it was it teasing pleasing had kind of been out and they'd already had a you know pretty good run on that one but scared had come out and i remember we saw it and said holy crap man this video is missing to blow up it's gonna be like all over mtv and you know it was such a different world back then you know everything was geared towards um you you had one video outlet that everybody was kind of buying for slots on and then and radio was pushing everything you know and we're in just such a such a different world now i mean it is video but everybody's on their you know on demand mobile crap now yeah. so it's just a different you know approach or whatever but back then it was great if you could get on MTV and get on one of those hard 60s or headbangers ball or something i mean you could you could go out and get busy it was it was just so exciting. I mean, to us, we had never, we got signed out of Memphis. We never traveled or anything until the record came out. Right. And uh, it was just, 
you know, we went with our eyes wide open and walked out there and went, oh, my God, there's a whole big old world out here. <laughs> 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 we just took in as much as we could. We just went, oh, my God, this is incredible. I mean, our A&R guy, uh, his name was Brian Huttenhauer, and he had worked with another – there was another guy at the A and M in the A and R department, uh, and I'm drawing a blank on his name. I'll think of it in a second. But they had signed uh, Extreme and Soundgarden, and we were their third band. Okay. And and Brian was the point person for us. He was an up and coming, uh, you know, A and R guy. And uh, I mean, he signed us out of Memphis, and then when we told him we were going to go to New York, we signed with a management company, uh, Loud and Proud, which was uh, out of Brooklyn. And they had a white line, they had white line, Taiketo, Overkill, uh, Mitch Malloy, and I think we were their fifth band. If I'm if I'm still remembering everybody, and uh, but he said he flew to Memphis. He said I'm getting in. We got in a 15 passenger van, and he said I want to see your face like the first time you pull into New York. I just want to <laughs> watch it when you say the skyline. So he rode with us, whatever it was, 20 hours or whatever it was up there, you know, and man it was just as soon as we saw it we were just like oh my god this is gonna be insane you know this is so different but, um, for them was, music, right? <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was really different and uh but it was man you know we've kind of been re- in a reflective mode a little bit you know through this whole process of just it was like getting hit by lightning man i mean we couldn't believe it we were just blown away we were so lucky that we um ran into the people at Ardent, you know, we, the, we had won a contest. We went in to re- do some recording on a little EP we were doing. And there was a guy, Paul Ebersole that produced our session. He just happened to be the guy, you know, that, that was on duty that day at the studio. And he worked with us. And then to the people that owned the studio and said, Hey man, we ought to see if we can do a production deal with these guys. Let's bring them in and talk to them. And, you know, Paul lives here now in Nashville where I live. And I, you know, I've told him before, I was like, man, dude, you like changed the whole trajectory of my life. I mean, I bumped into you and I was a little kid in high school and, you know, the next thing I knew we were like traveling around in a bus and doing concerts and it was just crazy, man. But it was so fun. And to be the age that we were and I mean, we were kind of like doing what everybody else was doing at, at college and, and high school and stuff, but we just were waking up somewhere different every day and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> diving into it so it. it was crazy it was fun it was just college on wheels you know so it was a lot of fun and if we were on the road we were at ardent so we were driving them crazy we bugged them <laughs> to death <laughs> if we didn't travel we were in there trying to make some noise or sneak in the studio or or do something but um yeah that paul Ebersole guy and then the guy that ran the the studio john fry was he was kind of like a, a father figure to us and um so you know he took us under his wing. He brought us in to the, you know, conference room and he drew a circle on the wall and he put like one little tiny line in it. He said, this is you and this is everybody else that's going to be like digging in your pocket. And so he was kind of our, our middle man, you know? Wow. And so we did a production deal with him and then they cut demos on us and then shopped us to the, the record labels and let us showcase. And, you know, I mean, when I think about it now, it's like a movie or something. It feels like that was somebody else, but it was such a fun time. It was so crazy. You know, it's it's funny. I was going as I keep going through stuff, and I see you guys at one point. Uh, you guys were like trying to pick the band name, and one of the options, I guess, was free beer. And I think they might yeah, think, and we laughed because <laughs> <laughs> we thought it was. I mean, I I know probably every that's been done a thousand times. We, we were just thinking if we said that, everybody show up. You know, right, every, right. all of our friends. We were high school kids, and we we're like, man, if we tell them it's beer here, you know, I'll call. They're coming, and. Uh, but yeah, it was funny. Um, there was a girl that we went to high school with that actually helped us pick the name Tora Tora. She actually made a list when I was at, at school with her, you know. And uh, Tora Tora, of course, was on the Women and Children First record. She had pulled it off there, and we just kind of took it. And when we first played together, there was like a little chant that got going, Tora, Tora. It was almost like the toga chant in Animal House, you right. know. <laughs> right, right. And uh, we just said, wow, man, this actually might work. We want we just hang on to that one for a minute and see if, see if it works. But anyway, um, it it served us well. You know, I think we, it kind of fit us. You know, people have asked us about it, and we had some funny questions asked 
of us about where we promoting war and stuff that the the tour 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 movie and all that. I mean, there is a link to it, but I mean, to us, it was just about getting together and having a great time. It was about right. celebrating. We weren't the only real conversation that that came out of was when we were in Europe. People that some of our press days over there, they had asked us if that was something that we were we were trying to make some big <laughs> political statement or something. We said, no, man, we love everybody. We want to, <laughs> you know, have a great time with y'all while we're here. And, um, but yeah, it was funny. We just, uh, we're very, very fortunate that we're, that we're all together and that we get to do this kind of being this far down the road as we are now to have run into frontiers. And it was kind of like the, the planets lined up, you know, we, we were all thinking that we wanted to, eventually at some point record together and stuff. And we were just trying to figure it out logistically and schedule wise. Right. And you know how life is, I man, you get sure. a thousand things going on and we have children. We're all like, you know, rock and roll dads. And, uh, but, uh, we just felt like the timing was right. The frontiers was great. Cause we, we knew of their reputation and we knew a lot of the bands on their label. We were friends with them or fans of them. And, and, uh, it just came along at the right time. And, it it was just uh we didn't take it for granted that we said hey man this is a you're giving us a huge opportunity to have a platform and a voice to sure. to reach out to you know the people that used to listen to us and uh, and to have been friends for as long as we've been i mean i literally met them when i was in like high school like 10th or 11th grade and we've known each other for that long and it's still the same four guys and you know, we never switched out any members or we never had any kind of big blowout thing. We just said, Hey, let's take a break. And then when we get ready to do it again, we'll do it. And <laughs> it was kind of funny when, I, when we lost our record deal, I mean, that part wasn't funny, but uh, we just said, Hey, you know, we didn't know what to do because that, that had been our life for like six years of just touring right. and recording and playing. And, and I was about 24 then, you know, and, uh, I was pretty devastated. I was like, holy crap, you know, the, we just put on the emergency break, all our momentum stopped. And uh, I remember thinking, hey, let's take a break. And to me, I was thinking like, I'll see you in a month, you know, like a normal <laughs> come off the road and <laughs> and we'll be back together quickly. But it was a big gap, man. It was a, it was a long time before we got back together. And I don't think it was any kind of like hard feelings or anything. I think everybody was just trying to process, you know, what had just happened because we went from going like, uh, 100 miles an hour to it was hard to get people call you back you know all of a sudden it was like man we kind of lost our our uh, support system and you know that is something you have to get adjusted to you know all of a sudden you're manning a lot of positions and stuff which uh what, what people you, today um, are doing that a lot yeah I was gonna say, like, what, sorry go ahead like at that point at that point like you're 24 years old and you know music it, it was a whole different world for you at that point for for everybody like what did you end up doing did you stick to doing music did you get like a day job or no i did i kept singing i i there was a guy on bill street named james govan he was uh he was a little dude he was about um he must have been in his late 40s early 50s something like that he was a little skinny guy he wore kind of a little captain's hat and he was a he was a drummer man he was a, he was a black guy he could man sing his ass off i mean he was a soul singer he sang al green and otis redding and all that had a horn section and all that stuff and i used to run around on bill street so i always like going in there and james, i looked up to james not only because he was just an incredible performer and singer and stuff but i just thought he was cool like i'd walk in he'd be in like a side booth with like three or four girls hanging around having a shot of something smoking a cigarette and i was like dude man this guy's got it going on you know uh but I remember going to see him when I lost the record deal and I told him, I said, man, I think it's not, if the record's coming out, it's not going to come out. They're going to show it. What am I going to do? You know, he said, man, you're a singer. You're just going to keep on singing. And, you know, it was just like this calm kind of came over me. He sat down and, you know, said, get yourself a you know drink and let's sit here and talk for a minute. And I think he had been in the music industry long enough that he had kind of seen some action, you know, this guy had some skin in the game and he was like, you got to, you know, don't panic. Yeah. Just, chill out you love what you're doing you're going to get put a plan together but i just kept singing and playing i went as really far away from torah I, I actually started doing acoustic stuff playing like blues things and you know i found out real quick when they called the blues there wasn't a lot of money for a little heavy metal singer and but yeah. i did love it and i, I enjoyed it I'm, I'm i was meaning that as a joke I, I grew up in the delta and um i did that was my heart was with 
acoustic stuff. That's where I started picking and playing and all that kind of stuff. And uh, But then I eventually bumped into another guy, and we played together for about seven or eight years until I met my wife. And then I kind of switched gears after that. I, I started working for the record labels and uh, worked for music publishing. And that's actually why I moved to Nashville, was to come up here and work for Sony and RCA. And, oh, cool. Um, it was cool, man. And to be a singer in a uh, on the outside and then come inside a corporate setting – um, I never knew any of these conversations were going on. We were out on the road kind of in survival mode. This was way before technology and all that stuff. So I didn't know any of these conversations were happening. We were just wondering if we were showing up to <laughs> the right location. <laughs> but uh, but it was great for me to come in and see it from that side and have the perspective that, that I had as an artist to come in and from a creative side and then to be able to do all this business stuff. I I met my wife and went back and got my master's degree in the entertainment business uh, communications and uh so that's kind of what i've been doing since uh, i moved up here about 14 years ago and uh, now i'm a, a professor of entertainment business which is hilarious but um it's a lot of fun <laughs> because it it uh i got into teaching uh, here at belmont university and i teach at sae institute and it's for people that are young coming into the business it's a it's a way for me to kind of be that John Fry that I was telling you about earlier, that mentor type right. guy that's kind of like, you know, I don't have all the answers. There's not a correct template, but I might can make you more efficient, make you aware of some things that can, you know, keep you out of a rabbit hole. And uh, yeah, that part makes me really, really if you, easy. If you do teach, like pretty much like from your life experiences, are you, are you teaching, you know, don't do what I did or here or this and that. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. I, and I mean, it's changed so much because, you know, we went into the, the digital realm now where it's, it's kind of a different business model, but the fundamental pieces are all the same. It's just they're in the digital, you know, uh, setting. And so those key fundamental pieces that we talk about, you know, the recording and, and music publishing, which is huge to me, the, them protecting copyright and stuff that they create. And then the touring aspect and then merch and licensing, you know, or, or other re- revenue streams that they can focus on right away if they're have existing content and catalog and all that kind of stuff. So those kind of conversations are fun, but yeah, I do actually do like some retrospective stuff where I'm telling them, you know, real life stories and stuff and they get real tickled, you know, this they're little, but they kind of get the, the gist of what's going on and the decisions, how one thing you do, you know, just on a knee jerk decision can have, you know, big re- repercussions on it later down the line. It's like with any business, you know, when you're starting out, you kind of have to, the hardest part is just, throwing yourself in the briar patch, you know, or into the fire. And, and that's how you learn. And, and some of those mistakes hurt pretty bad, but you know, you can help somebody up. If you do that, you can turn around and tell the person behind you to say, Hey man, you know, I can pull you out of this thing. I already done this already. So, you know, that part makes it kind of keeps it fun. You know? Well, how about, uh, let, let's talk about the new album, Bastards of Beale, uh, which comes out in a few weeks on February 22nd. Um, to, to me now, maybe you, you tell me if I'm wrong or not, but from listening to the album, it sounds very uh, – not, not only the musical style, but the sound itself just sounds very 70s. It is 70s. Yeah, we kind of did that uh, purposely. We went in. We were we were limited, number one, on time um, just because I'm – logistically, I was coming from Nashville to Memphis, and so I was you know going – traveling down on weekend or whatever that I could do. And we did tons of pre-production ahead of time so we could do it as quickly as we could budget-wise to get in and out. But um, I think it showed a lot of our influences. Number one, it it showed how we're going to sound when you come to see us live. This record is really, really raw. I mean, it is just we've got rhythm guitars and solos and a little bit of backgrounds, but that's it. There's no tambourines. There's no keyboard. There's no – we didn't use (laughs) auto-tune. We didn't use a click track. We went in, and it's just ebb and flow and – we were all in the room live and they isolated me just in case I wanted to fix anything or if I, or if I did get it, you know, they had a good take without all the bleeding, uh, bleeding in and everything. So we were really proud of it. I mean, it was, it was so different than a long time ago because, you know, we used to do eight weeks at a time. We would do, um, uh, recording sessions, you know, right. for a major label, you'd block a studio out. But this time it was like, Hey, we're on a budget and we got to get in and knock this crap out. So, we went in and we did it in about six days. We did two days of basic tracks, uh, two days of solos and singing, and then they did two days mixing. And that was it. we sent it off to get mastered, and that was it. And but it was the most fun creative thing I've done in forever. I mean, I think we just, 
I think we just went to purge a bunch of stuff we'd been holding on to, you know, just from right. everything from our content of our lyrics to the riffs. You know, I know I had woodshedded some ideas a, a little bit ahead of time that I was like, man, if I ever got with Keith and them for a second, I would want to work this up. But the majority of it was just we just created it just sitting around with each other and everybody contributed music. And the awesome part about doing it now is technology. I mean, we were in some weird tunings and stuff. You know, we stretched out that way. And so we could film our, our chord progressions on a, and, and, you know, text it over to each other uh, when, we were, when we weren't together, when we were out of town and stuff and, and learn the parts when we were separate. So we didn't have all this cool stuff a long time ago. So that part made it made us a little more efficient and. But overall, the whole record is just, it's just us, man. It's its as close to our first EP when we were like 17 or 18 that we've ever done. <laughs> we're way wow. down the line from that. <laughs> That's wild. Like, ha- had you been like writing songs over the years, thinking to yourself, hey, if we do another Yeah, we, we never, we never stopped. Everybody was all still creative and writing and picking. And um, it just had to be the, it just had to be the right time. And I think for this thing to fly and it just, I mean, I'm not kidding. It was like divine intervention. We bumped into the Frontiers people, and we were like, "Man, yeah, this is this is exactly what we need to do right now." So everybody was on board. So, awesome. do you think? Uh, I mean, something that's rare with you guys compared to a lot of the other bands from from the era is, uh, I mean, it, it, the four of you guys, it's the four original guys that are still together all these years later. Um, do you think if it wasn't the, that the case, they think yeah, you, you wouldn't go forward with it, or? I don't know, man. I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't know. I know it takes the four of us to do what that tour tour sound. It, it's Keith on guitar and, and Patrick on bass. I mean, we've all played with different people and been creative, and w- that part never goes away. But I, when the four of us crank on together, that's the band. That's what the sound is. So so that part's exciting, and we enjoy it. I mean, we're still telling the same dumb jokes and all that stuff, but it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. We've known each other a really long time. That's awesome. Now, but we're super doing, uh, excited about it. Uh, yeah, I was going to say you guys are doing a third anniversary uh, surprise attack as well. Yeah, we're touching on it. We kind of we did she's good, she's bad at one of the last things, which we hadn't done that one. And I don't even remember the last time that was in the set. Um, but um, we we haven't. I'm sure we're going to do some kind of acknowledgement of it this year. We haven't like sat down and just said, hey, we're just going to do the whole album. And I, I know that's probably what some people especially in our hometown and stuff would say man we want you to do that but we haven't quite done that yet uh we are adding and cha- you know changing the set around and stuff but some of it depends on uh guitar tunings and stuff for keith especially on the new stuff just from uh uh making the the, the set run smoothly and stuff for him where he's not you know stressed out worrying about guitar world but um and and some of it is you know vocally we want to make sure I'm I feel good but I, honestly thank goodness we're we're uh, rested up man we've been saving up for a long time so we we're hungry we're ready to go see everybody the record will be out uh, February 22nd uh, the new video is coming out uh, the week the record drops which uh, we've let out Rose of Jericho and then we let out Silence of Sirens and the new one is Son of a Prodigal Son. And the cool story behind that is we shot it where we shot walking shoes 30 years ago. We were in the same room, same bar, Handy Hall on Bill Street. We did full, oh, wow. full circle, got permission to go in there and shoot. Um, and the guy that is running it now uh, ran a, a venue a long time ago called the New Daisy Theater is where we started. And he was the, the manager of the building. So now he manages the Handy Hall, which was – there's a bunch of like uh, – synchronicity or whatever it is with all the things that lined up with this thing that just made it kind of have all these different stories and stuff. So we're excited about it, man. I just really can't tell you how much I appreciate you letting me talk to the audience and stuff. Thank you for giving me a a platform because we we miss everybody. I think one of the biggest things for us is just being on stage and and touring, at least for me personally, is the one thing that, I mean, I miss that the most of the times that we were taken off. It's just it was so ingrained in us when we were little. It's such a big part of our life that yeah, uh, you walk out and 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 see the crowd and and the guitars come on and you're just like uh, you know I'm still at stage fright. I'm still worried and <laughs> and then I walk out there and go oh my god I love this. No one I like the scared part. This is my my adrenaline's going crazy. So um so we miss that part and we miss you know those people are our family. Those the people that bought our records and listen and I mean they're the only reason that we get to do this. So. 
for us to have the opportunity to connect with them is just it's just the greatest feeling in the world. It's awesome. That's awesome. Now you, you mentioned earlier how uh, you know all you guys have grown up now and uh, kids and all that. Do you have children? I do. Three boys, eighteen, sixteen, and fourteen. So, what do they think of uh, their rock star dad? Uh, man, they just don't know what to think. They, they. <laughs> I mean, when I met my wife, I had kind of shifted gears and went to the business side. So they, they didn't know this part. They just kind of saw videos from a long time ago and laughed. You know, thought we were funny, and I was hitting high notes and stuff, but. They went to the video shoot. My my older two sons are kind of into digital editing, and they want to do film and stuff like that. So they really like seeing the process of that and how it was all put together. And to just be honest with you, man, they're they're a gift. They they like saved my life, man. I mean, they're awesome, and they're so more advanced than I was with technology and all that stuff nowadays. Sure. They just constantly blow me away, man. I just I can't get I'm over good. it. But uh, it's been amazing. But the, you know, now they're bigger and they have their own agendas and and um, schedules and all that kind of stuff. And that's afforded me the opportunity to where now I can go back out and, and travel a little bit and have fun. And I'm not planning on slowing down. We've, we've, we're going to take uh, the launch of this record. We're going to go out and start going to some of our good markets. We're going to do some of the festivals. And uh, and uh, I just want to stay connected now, you know, to this is kind of uh, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't mean that in the, I, my expectations are in the right place, but I just think that, um, it just means a lot to us to go out and visit people and, and play live and stuff. It's a, it's just something that's it's important. It's part of who we are. And, and sure. doing the family thing is something that uh, none of us took lightly. We didn't want to miss anything, but we feel like, you know, they're getting up and they're independent. And we're like, cool, man, we can sneak off for a couple, <laughs> yeah. a couple of days over the weekend and go out and crank up the amps and stuff. So that part yeah, is absolutely. making it really awesome. That's awesome, man. That's freaking awesome. So, and you guys got some shows coming up. You got uh, going on the Monsters of Rock cruise uh, end of February. Yes, we're doing Monsters of Rock. Then we do Rocklanta, uh, March 29th and 30th. We're there on Saturday the 30th. And then we do, um, then we'll be at M3. And then we head out to Colorado after that. Nice. Good so we're here. excited and we're adding more and more shows. We just, uh, right now, there's some that are not confirmed yet that are in between some of those, but if people will just watch us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, we're updating social media all the time, or you can go to tour, tour, uh, music.com and that's our website. So you'll see the information on there and you can get our merch and, um, keep up with all the latest information. Awesome. Anthony, thanks man for doing this. It was a pleasure talking to you. Continue hey, success. listen, thank you for right. letting me talk to you. That that was really nice of you to do it today. And uh, I'll have to stay in touch with you. Maybe after we get a, a few shows under our belt, we can reconnect and I can talk to you about uh, the response on the, the singles and the record and everything. Once the, uh, the, all the other songs on the record come out, I'm kind of interested to see what people are going to say about the uh, the songs. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. We'll keep in touch and I uh, hope you guys make it to Philly. You guys are going to be close to M3. Awesome, man. Listen, if we come that way, please come see us, and we'll get you in. I'm there. I'm so there. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for this, man. It's great talking to you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.